Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to today's PDH course on structural bearings. I'll be the host. Uh, my name is Ryan Lovely. I am a project manager for Magiba North America located up in Canada. Uh, today our presenter is Ahmet Kuktimbale. He is our technical manager at Magiba New York. Uh, he is a civil engineer, a professional engineer as well, specialist uh, with bridge bearings with more than 10 years of experience. Today, some shopkeeping would be related to the course number. So this is a PDH course and it is one uh, PDH credit and it's awarded upon attending for a full 50 minutes and it's required by the, the Institute. So in order to receive your, your certificate, you need to make sure you're in attendance for at least the 50 minutes. And we'll be sending that within uh, the next two weeks. Uh, the course number is 2021757. Nine. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Amit, who will lead us through the presentation. I just need to make sure I unmute him so that he can, he can speak to everyone. Um, sorry, bear with me here. Attendees, staff, unmute. All right. Amit, <laughs> and good morning, everyone. Um, so we have a quite a bit of con content here. So what I'll do is um, give a quick introduction on bearings, uh, go through different types of bearings. I will uh, go really quick through rocker, roller, and elastomeric bearings because they are much simpler. And uh, I'll spend a little bit more time on HLMR bearings. And then finally, we have put together some interesting case studies, uh, typically bearings that we don't see every day, uh, like uplift or complex applications. So hopefully that will be interesting as well. And then I'll just summarize the, the slides. So let's get right into it. Um, so introduction, uh, as most of us know, bearings are the most critical components on uh, bridges, buildings, and infrastructures. What do they really do? They primarily transfer vertical and horizontal loads. They accommodate movements, and most important, they accommodate rotations, right? Otherwise, you could put a, a piece of brick if you don't need any movement or rotation. Uh, some special functions, sometimes it might be cheaper to uh, or more economical to include uh, functions like uh, tie down. Uh, so bearings can act as a vertical uplift restraint or they can also provide seismic isolation where you can use uh, lead rubber bearings or high damping rubber bearings or pendulum isolators as well. Uh, because bearings have wear components like sliding materials or uh, rotational polyurethane disc or elastomer, uh, they typically require periodic maintenance and inspections. Bearings come in all shapes and sizes. They can be really tiny, like you see here on the left. Uh, it's uh, they are disc bearings for the Hudson Rail Yards in New York, um, just 60 pounds. And on the right, these are spherical bearings for the Transpay uh, Transit Center in California, the bus terminal. And these are only uh, 100 pounds, roughly. But they can also be massive, like the ones you see here. Uh, the bearings on the left are over 30,000 pounds. Uh, they are pot bearings for the Hong Kong Convention Center. Each bearing has a load capacity of 47,000 kips, so quite massive. But the ones on the right are even bigger. They are spherical bearings for a bridge in Vietnam. Each bearing has a load capacity of 56,000 kips, uh, the biggest we ever did, so absolutely massive bearings. Almost 38,000 pounds uh, weight of each bearing. And then uh, bearings accommodate uh, their functions in different ways. Like you see here on the top, uh, in the top row, they can uh, provide movements and rotations by deformation. Like in case of elastomeric bearings, you can accommodate movement by shear deformation or in elastomeric pot or disc bearings, you can allow rotation by compre uh, differential compression like you see here. Or you can do that by pure mechanics as you see in the second row. You can uh, allow movement by sliding, or you can allow rotation also by sliding, but curvature instead of flat sliding. And finally, the older types of bearings like rocker roller bearings, uh, like roller bearings would accommodate movement by rolling, and rocker bearings would have a pivot point, and then they would rotate about that pivot point um, to provide unidirectional rotation. Classification based on function. Uh, typically, there are three kinds of uh, bearings, fixed, free, and guided. Fixed bearings are, as the name says, fixed. They don't allow any movements. Free bearings allow movements in all directions. And guided bearings, they you can uh, 
lock them in one direction and allow movement in the other direction. And then you can also combine the functions, like you can make a bearing free uh, during construction and fixed during uh, service or vice versa. For example, if you have a gantry construction, uh, you can make a bearing fixed when the span is put in place, but not tight both ends, so the bearing can be fixed. Uh, and then once the construction is complete, you can make the bearing uh, free, uh, uh, free to move. Moving on to types of bearings. Um, generally, these are the classification uh, for the main types of bearings that you typically see. On the left here, you see older metal bearings like rocker and roller. Then you have elastomeric bearings, which are rubber-based bearings, could be plain pads, or they can be reinforced. And then on the right, you have HLMR bearings, which is high load multi-rotational bearings. When you have higher loads uh, and rotation demands, then you can use pot, disc, or spherical bearings. And we look into uh, each one of them in, in detail. Rocker and roller bearings, I'm not going to spend too much time on that. These are typically older bearings that you used to see or still see on very old bridges. Uh, uh, they uh, can take high loads, but their functionality, they have lots of issues, which I'll talk in a bit. Um, but rocker bearings allow movement, uh, uh, rotation, sorry, and roller bearings allow movements, but you can also combine them. I mean, you can make a rock and roller bearing, so you can uh, accommodate movement and rotations at the same time. But these bearings, we uh, don't recommend them on new structures. Doesn't really make sense to use them because you have modern bearings available now. Uh, these have like quite some issues, like they, it's all metal to metal, uh, so it creates large friction on the piers. Uh, typically, they are unidirectional functionality. Uh, they are prone to corrosion. You cannot, because you need that uh, surface finish uh, and the curvature, you cannot slap a lot of corrosion protection. If you do, over time, it gummies up, and then you lose that spherical surface or cylindrical surface. And uh, they have quite poor load distribution because you get this linear load on the concrete or seal structure below. So especially in case of concrete, you need to make sure that uh, you have a strong uh, substructure. So, so they have quite some issues. Uh, we don't really recommend them anymore to use on new structures. Elastomeric bearings, uh, they are rubber-based bearings. They, you can have natural rubber or you can use uh, artificial rubber, which is chloroprene, also called neoprene. Um, it depends on the region. For example, if you have a uh, cold temperature like Canada, you should use more often natural rubber because uh, the artificial rubber has some oils which crystallizes as it gets cold. So for that case, natural rubber makes more sense. Um, but uh, uh, it depends depends on different uh, owners and regions, uh, what's their preference. They could be plain packs for smaller loads or they could be you could use steel shims. Uh, steel shims, what they do is they stiffen the bearing in the vertical direction, but still allow flexibility in the horizontal direction to allow movements. Um, and they are generally good for smaller loads. Um, this this uh, range suggested here, by the way, is a typical range, does not mean that you cannot use elastomeric bearings for bigger loads, you can, but uh, this is generally a range where they are uh, very economical in. And for shear deformation, you are limited to small movements because for three inch movement, for example, you need six inches uh, tall elastomer. If you have 10 inches, you'll need a 20 inch tall elastomer. So then it makes more economical sense to pair them with like sliding interfaces. Uh, they are very durable. They are low cost. They are low maintenance. That's why they are widely used on simple applications like highway bridges. Generally don't have corrosion issues. Uh, but they, uh, once you, uh, once the demands get more challenging, bigger, then they are not cost effective anymore because larger elastomeric bearings, it's difficult to vulcanize them homogeneously. Um, la large movement, as I said, requires external sliding system. And then dip, uh, elastomeric bearings inherently are free type. So to make them fixed or guided, you need uh, steel restraints around them. So then they are not really economical anymore. So very durable bearings, but as the load demands and rotation demands uh, increase, then you need to move on to um, HLMR bearings, which brings me to these. Uh, generally speaking, there are three types, pot, disc, and spherical bearings. Uh, uh, pot bearings were developed in Europe, very widely used in Europe, Asia, uh, rest of the world. Uh, in the US, you see more disc bearings. They were developed in the US. It's a market preference. We think both are similar in terms of capabilities, quite interchangeable, um, but then, when you have spherical bearings, um, 
uh, when you have demands that are more challenging, like very high rotations, then it makes sense to use spherical bearings. Uh, but I'll, I'll uh, detail through each one of them um, um, one by one. So, so we see what are their use cases, what are their benefits, and what are their limitations. Pot bearings, uh, they are uh, rubber-based bearings. Again, you have an uh, elastomeric part. And then you have a pot and piston assembly. For example, here you see on the picture on the left, you have a piston, then you have an elastomeric pad for rotation. And then you seal that uh, chamber with uh, with the piston on top. So you get this uh, sealed assembly and then under high pressure, the elastomer behaves as a fluid. So you need to make sure that you have uh, high tolerance machining everywhere. It's all smooth, so you don't have friction and you don't wear out the elastomeric disc, but then the elastomer behaves as a fluid and with differential compression uh, it accommodates uh, rotations for movements you have an external uh, sliding interface like you see here uh, on top um, so that way you're not limited like elastomeric bearings you can uh, provide theoretically unlimited movement capacity and for a horizontal load you have this uh, po uh, po piston to pot wall that transfers the horizontal forces um, so that also pot bearings are very good for for large horizontal forces they can take easily loads in uh, up to like 5000 kips no problem rotations up to 0.04 radians no problem and movement as i mentioned it's not really limited here you see uh, assembly of the pot you have an elastomer and then uh, you would get the uh, piston on the top and once that's assembled and you put the uh, sliding plate on top uh, then you get the full assembly in this case it's a guided pot bearing so you can see here the two guides so it would uh, allow movement only in uh, one direction what are the benefits of pot bearings ideally uh, they are very good for high horizontal load applications because you have this big area big pot wall so compared to say disc bearings where you have a central pin in the middle so in pot bearings, you have a much larger surface area. So for the same size of disc bearing, uh, pot bearing can take uh, much higher horizontal loads. Disc bearings, of course, you can make it bigger, but then it's a matter of economy. Uh, pot bearings, because they are confined, uh, the vertical deformation is very small compared to a disc bearing. So in some cases, um, that, that might be helpful. Uh, they also have smaller restoring movement because uh, or in other words, they have smaller resistance to rotation because the elastomeric material is much uh, softer than say a disc bearing. Generally on bridge applications, it, it doesn't matter because uh, the order of magnitude of that increased restoring moment is quite small. Um, but nevertheless, for, for example, light roof structures on stadiums, that could be an important factor. Limitations, um, pot bearings are more sensitive to metal to metal contact because the clearance on between the, between the pot and the piston is quite small. Uh, so you can over rotate it in cases if you're not careful. Um, some owners don't like the fact that the rotational element is confined and cannot be inspected. In our opinion, that's really not a problem. Um, and then in the US, there has been support bearing uh, failures. This I must say is not a design flaw, but it's rather poor uh, manufacturing and quality control because you can have the best design, but if you don't manufacture it properly, then it's, it's not gonna work. Um, for example, about the ceiling, uh, I think in the US some suppliers use still brass ceilings. We stopped doing that many years ago. Uh, we use palm ceilings, which is polyoxymethylene, so it's a polymer. Brass ceilings are metal, they are metal rings and they just sit on the elastomer, so you have metal to metal contact, you have, it's inflexible, you have uh, low wear resistance because you have high friction and they are not vulcanized into the rubber. On the other hand, palm uh, ceilings, as we use, uh, they are modern ceilings. They are made up of individual chain elements and they are vulcanized into the elastomer. So it's part of the vulcanization process. So it's part of the elastomer itself. And they provide high wear resistance because it's, there's no metal to metal contact. And because they are individual elements, uh, it's highly adaptive to, uh, to rotations. And we have uh, tested pot, uh, palm ceilings on pot bearings to two miles of sliding path, that means we have tested them to 1.1 million uh, rotation cycles and 37 KSI pressure, that's really, really high. So we have had no failures of palm ceiling. So just keep that in mind that uh, for fa failures in the US, whichever, however, uh, that maybe it's not related to the design, but it's more 
so poor manufacturing or materials and then um, disc bearings uh, moving to disc bearings um, as the name says you have a rotational disc which is unconfined unlike pot bearings this is a much harder material uh, um, this polyethyreurethane um, and the uh, functionality of the disc bearings is similar you have differential compression to accommodate rotation and then for sliding you have uh, like pot bearings an external sliding interface and the horizontal load is transferred with this uh, central pin in the middle uh, similar like pot bearings you can take uh, quite high uh, vertical loads up to 5000 kips uh, high rotations 0.04 radians and then movement capacity are not really limited here you see an example uh, for of a disc bearing uh, you have the bearing plate and then the shear pin in the middle uh, and then the, this disc will sit on top um, to, uh, to allow the rotations uh, this is the bearing uh, these are the bearings for the corpus christi harbor bridge in texas where you see the disc which is here rotational disc and then you have the upper bearing plate uh, we have a higher grade sliding material here on this project uh, i'll talk about that in a bit um, so this allows sliding in this case it's a guided bearing that's why you have a sliding strip on the side as well and then you'll get a sliding plate on top uh, which is not shown there um, but in this case it's a fixed bearing so you have the top and bottom and then uh, the top plate is bolted to the structure and the bottom plate is uh, welded uh, uh, embedded into the concrete sorry but then it's bolted to the bearing itself so you can replace the bearing so you, you can replace everything but the anchor plate and here you can also do bevel sole plates to uh, take the dead load rotations in the bridge uh, and then here you can see it's a bolted assembly on top for replacement and in the bottom it's a small bearing so we recess it it's easy to lift up and replace so that's not a problem uh, to summarize disc bearings, they are very simple construction, so they are cost effective. It's just a sandwich of different parts, so it's easy to install, easy to inspect. Uh, you can inspect the rotational elements, so sometimes the owners like that. Um, it's very, The disc itself is very resilient to environmental effects like water and radiation and sun and UV, uh, so they are quite maintenance free and they are generally low profile. So for a comparable pot bearing, uh, height of disc bearing would be smaller. Limitations, they are not suitable for very high rotations like over 0.04 radians. It's quite, uh, that's quite large value that you don't see often, but nevertheless, that's really, uh, I would say, the typical limit uh, up to which you can get a, a disc bearings, design economical design of disc bearings. Uh, very hard, a large horizontal force, pot bearings are better, like I said, because you have that bigger pot wall uh, in a pot bearing to resist the horizontal force uh, versus in a disc bearing you have that internal shear pin in the middle so uh, pot bearing is definitely better and then um, uh, they are not very economical for a combination of low vertical load uh, and high rotation but same applies to pot bearings so in that case you need to move on to spherical bearings which is the last one that I'm going to talk about here in types of bearings uh, spherical bearings, uh, as the name suggests, you have a spherical element. Uh, so in this case, you don't have a compression element for the rotation. A rotation is uh, accommodated by pure mechanics. So you have sliding on a curvature. Um, so you have the top flat sliding element for movements, and then you have the bottom curved sliding element for rotations. Uh, and then movement, of course, like I said, it's also sliding like pot and disc bearings. But here for rotation, you're not depending on the properties of the elastomer or polyether urethane. So uh, because of that, it's suitable for very, very high vertical loads uh, and is much more economical as the loads get higher compared to a pot or disc bearings. You can take very, very high rotations, uh, 0.1 radians, which is extremely large. Um, and then they are ideal for low vertical load and high rotation combination because the, because it's pure mechanics of sliding you really have no resistance to rotation other than uh, the friction in the sliding material one thing i wanted to point out is you'll often see this design on the top uh, of spherical bearings we never really recommend them for bridge applications uh, the design that you see here on top uh, transfers the horizontal force through the curvature so then you have really a limit on the horizontal force in our opinion this is okay for buildings but for bridges for fixed or guided bearing it doesn't make any sense uh, 
because you have to provide a very steep curvature, you get tall bearings, and then horizontal load capacity is very limited. And if you don't have enough vertical load to pin the bearing down, it's quite dangerous actually for low minimum vertical loads because there's nothing to keep the bearing in place. You can It can slide out or ride out. We always use the design that you see on bottom. So as you can see here, we isolate the uh, uh, curvature from horizontal load. The horizontal load flows through from, uh, from the guides to the um, uh, concave part here. Uh, in case of fixed bearing, it would be a pot wall, so it would be like a pot spherical bearing. Uh, so the curvature is completely isolated, so you can take very high horizontal loads and you don't need really uh, large minimum vertical loads. So that's, that's not a problem at all. So for bridge applications, we really recommend this type and not the one on top. Even Ashto, by the way, mentions that external restraint is often a more reliable method for resisting large lateral loads. So an example here for spherical bearing we did for a project in Colorado, you can see the, the scale of the bearing. You have very high horizontal forces. Um, so in this case, we could easily transfer it uh, and isolate it from the curvature. Otherwise, if we had to do it with the curvature, it would be a massive bearing and would not be an optimal design. For if generally you don't have large transverse rotation, so you can take it with the compression and the sliding strip. But if you do have a large transverse rotation, you can have a tilting bar here with curvature. So that's not a problem at all. Uh, so that's one of the main benefits of spherical bearings that large rotations with small vertical loads are totally fine. Second, uh, you have almost no vertical deformation under dead load uh, in case of pot or more so in case of disc bearings, uh, especially because disc bearings are uh, unconfined, you have some, once uh, the Poisson's ratio of the material is almost 0.5, right? So when you compress it uh, vertically, it'll expand horizontally. So you get some vertical compression under dead load. Uh, in bridges, generally, it's not an issue. Uh, mixing bearings could be an issue where you get differential compression. But in case of buildings or roof structures, that could be an issue. So spherical bearings, of course, there's no compression element. So in over a long period of time, you get some comp very minimal compression in the sliding material. But other than that, it's just your mechanics under dead load. You don't have that uh, permanent compression. Then third is in a spherical bearing, rotation is possible also in tension loading. So this is uh, very important because uh, pot or disc bearings, they're compression-based bearings, right? So you need them to compress, you need a compressive load for them to be able to rotate. In spherical bearing, you can, for example, have two uh, sliding surfaces, two curved sliding surfaces, and then you get uh, rotational capability in tension as well as compression. So that's no problem at all. And I have a case study on that, so I'll, I'll discuss that a bit more in detail, but that's very um, important benefit of uh, spherical bearings. Then also because uh, you can make spherical bearings very compact, for example, in monorail bridges where you have large eccentricity, uh, for example, uh, the bridges in the middle of the city, you have narrow piers, you have space for only one bearing, and say a train uh, passes only in one direction, not both trains, but only one direction, then you have this large uh, eccentricity of the vertical load. So you get compression on the inner side and tension on the far side. So with spherical bearings, you can make it very compact with the two surfaces um, that like with pot and disc bearings, it's difficult to do. So that's another benefit of spherical bearings. And then finally, uh, spherical bearings, they are ideal for pairing with high grade sliding material because on a disc or pot bearing, for example, uh, I showed the picture, uh, the, the bearing before from Texas there we have uh, the higher grade sliding materials. So you do get the benefit of uh, 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 longer service life of the sliding material, but uh, load-wise, you are still limited by the allowable pressure on the disc or the elastomer case case of a pot bearing. But in spherical bearings, other than the sliding material, everything else is steel. So if, if you use a strong sliding material and you ensure that the concrete uh, below is strong, then you can really make a compact bearing for very, very large loads. Um, so that's really a benefit of spherical bearings. For example, here, uh, each bearing has a load capacity of 56,000 kips, which is equal to the weight of three Eiffel Towers. So this, to do this with a pot or disc bearings, they would just become very massive and would not be economical. And when it comes to sliding materials, so I mentioned that spherical bearings are ideal for pairing with high-grade sliding materials. So the question 
is why do we need a higher grade sliding material? Why not just PTFE? Um, so PTFE is a well-known sliding material. It is a good material. It's been used. It's used widely on almost uh, most of the structures in the U.S. at least. Uh, however, it has uh, its limitations. Uh, there are three major limitations. One is the allowable pressure. Uh, it's limited to 4.5 ksi uh, pressure at service loads. It's not small, but for uh, applications where you have very high loads, this can make the bearing too big. Then uh, the movement capacity, so the accumulated movement capacity of PTFE is limited to 14 miles. So for example, if your bridge moves for uh, just to say a number one mile every year, that means you would have to replace the PTFE every 14 years. Uh, this is again not relevant for highway bridges, it's fine, but in long span suspension bridges, uh, this, this uh, could be a problem where you, you would have to replace the sliding material very often. And then the friction also as the temperature goes lower, pressure becomes smaller, um, you have more wear and forces on the pier. So the alternative uh, to that is, for example, UHMWPE, which is ultra high molecular weight polyethylene. So it's a polyethylene material uh, that we use. Our trade name for that is RoboSlide, but the generic uh, word I'll, I'll mention here is UHMWPE. And as you can see here, uh, RoboSlide ha uh, has lower friction. Uh, UHMWP has lower friction than PTFE. Uh, woven PTFE is even worse. It has even higher uh, friction. Uh, woven PTFE is used in spherical bearings because it has higher allowable pressure, but you sacrifice friction, so so it doesn't really make sense. Uh, UHMWP, on the other hand, has much lower friction, so you have lower forces on the pier. It has uh, much higher allowable pressure. For example, PTFE is 4.5 ksi. RoboSlide we have tested to 13 ksi. Uh, for Ashto projects, we generally design conservatively to twice the value of PTFE, um, so 9 KSI, uh, but you still get uh, a very compact bearing compared to a PTFE bearing. And then finally, resistance to wear. Uh, PTFE, like I mentioned, has been tested to 14 miles. UHMWP, we have tested it to over 30 miles with no wear, so we know that it's good for at least 30 miles, likely much more. So it just directly means that you have you get an increased service life uh, um, of of the bearing. And cost-wise, it's not so much more. Uh, it's 50 percent more than PTFE, but keep in mind that the cost of bearing uh, is not cost of RoboSlide. Uh, the cost of bearing is maybe 10 to 20 percent of the cost of the bearing. So 50 percent times 20 percent is just a 10 percent overall difference in the cost. But you get so many benefits on the other hand. So. Uh, so that's that's something on sliding materials to keep in mind. Um, uh, to summarize spherical bearings, uh, the benefits, they are ideal for very large rotations. Uh, elastomeric pot or disc bearings, you have to keep making the material taller and taller, like the disc uh, or the elastomer. And once, uh, as you keep making it taller, of course, it's vertical stiffness reduces. So you, uh, especially in disc bearings or elastomeric bearings, you would keep uh, getting more and more vertical deformation. So that's something to consider that when you have very large rotation, spherical bearings are, are very good. Uh, they can be very compact for large vertical loads, especially when paired with better sliding materials. They are very effective for frequent uplift designs. I'll present that in a case study. Uh, and uh, the second design that I mentioned, not the one where you transfer horizontal loads with curvature, but the other one, you can transfer very, very high horizontal loads with almost no vertical loads, no problem at all. So that's also a very big benefit. Limitations, I would say, generally they are taller than a comparable disc bearings. Typically, it's not an issue, but in some cases it might be. Uh, then uh, another thing you have to consider is that you have to make sure the concrete structure is strong enough because uh, the bearing and the sliding material can be strong, but if the concrete below is not strong, then that concrete pressure will govern the, the design of the bearing. So uh, to make it economical, you have to make sure that the concrete is strong. Uh, but for new structures, we generally see it's not an issue to use higher grade concrete at all. And then for very small uh, loads, spherical bearings with very small radius, especially free type, uh, uh, <clears throat> but the curvature is not so steep. It can be cost prohibitive to manufacture. So for such applications, of course, you can use elastomeric bearings uh, uh, without a problem. So in our opinion, spherical bearings are really state of the art bearings. And whenever you have demanding applications, spherical bearings uh, makes the most sense.
So that was it uh, on different types of bearings. I wanted to spend uh, at least half of the time on uh, the case studies because this is something more interesting, technically uh, speaking. Um, so I'll have three case studies. Uh, first one here is a frequent uplift uh, application. So it's a tension compression application uh, that we recently did on the Delaware Memorial Bridges. Uh, these are twin suspension bridges that connect New Jersey and Delaware. Uh, they were constructed about 17 years apart. Uh, DRBA owns the, the bridge and it gets a lot of traffic, about 80,000 vehicles uh, every day. Uh, and the bridges have been uh, in service for a long time, several decades. So right now they have, uh, or they used to have an existing pin and link. That's how they were constructed, as you see it here. So the pin and link system is like an arm and rotation movements are accommodated by that uh, rotation of that arm about this pivot point. Um, and uh, when we went to inspect these, uh, as they have been in service for a long time, you had some corrosion and then the hole uh, had, uh, because of corrosion, become bigger. So when you go on the bridge and stand on the finger joint on top, you could feel the rattling vertical vibration because, because of that difference in the diameters of the pins, the pin and the holes. So the owner wanted to replace it with a modern bearing. Um, um, so uh, we worked with HNTB and DRBA here um, for to to uh, look at the requirements and come up with a, a bearing solution. Uh, the downward load is not so much because it's suspension bridge, so only the load from the end of the spans go to the bearing. But the vertical uplift is 191 kips. The magnitude is not that large, but it occurs frequently every day, several times. So it's frequent tension compression. So it's cyclic loading. So you can have issues of fatigue, uh, rotation 0.037 radian, not small. And uh, the movement so on the side span is 12 inches, but on the center span, it's quite large, plus minus 23 inches. And then bearings needed to be temporarily guided, uh, but then free in service. Um, and then we also did some monitoring system. We uh, we equipped the bearing with pressure sensors, uh, movement sensors, rotation tilt meters, and sliding material wear sensor. But because time is very limited, I'm going to skip that part. Uh, but if you're interested, please reach out to us, and uh, we can provide more info on that as well. So. We came up with a spherical bearing solution, eight for the main span, eight for the side span. Um, uh, because I mentioned we have tension compression and the bearing needs to be able to rotate in both loading cases, tension and compression. That's why we came up with a spherical bearing. Uh, here you see uh, we did same envelope design uh, for both side span and main span. The only difference was that the main span bearings, the sliding plates are longer um, than the center span. And typically, the sliding plate is on top, the bearing is on bottom, but in this case, just they didn't have enough space on top. So we had to invert the bearing and then put some dust protection bellows uh, so that the sliding uh, system is protected from dust, dirt, and water. Here you see a cross section of the bearing. So on the left side, you see the load path of the bearing in compression. So this upper sliding material is active in compression. And then <clears throat> on the right side, you see the load path and tension. The bottom sliding material is active in tension. Um, and then the central bolts are pre-tensioned. So this whole bolted assembly rotates together. And then the color-wise, you can see this upper uh, yellow part moves front and back. But then for rotation, this bolted assembly rotates relative to everything else. So you don't get. Uh, with these pretension bolts and everything rotating together, you don't get any bending or any moments on, on the bolts. So everything is held together tightly with these pretension bolts. Uh, these <clears throat> sliding materials are always under compression. So imagine if you had a compression-based bearing, it will only rotate in compression. We have done solutions uh, with compression-based bearing for frequent uplift, but then you have to stack two compression-based bearings on top with a plate in between. And then when that plate pulls up, the upper bearing is in compression. When the plate pushes down, the bottom bearing is in compression, but it's very complicated because you have to pre-compress the bearing and so on. So in that sense, this solution just made sense. Here you can see the movement, like the top hole part, uh, move uh, moving closer to the tower. And then you can also see how the rotation works. This top assembly is rotated uh, because uh, these are frequent uplift bearings. We also uh, uh, did a detailed finite element analysis on each 
uh, part as well as all as a global assembly on the bolted connections. Uh, we avoided welding of any parts because of the cyclic loading. Uh, we wanted to avoid fatigue issues, so everything is bolted. Uh, but with finite element analysis, we made sure that uh, we don't have uh, large displacements or strains uh, because we also had a cyclic tension compression test that I'll talk about in a bit, which had a limitation that uh, the passing criteria was like less than a 16th inch of uh, vertical movement. So we wanted to make sure with finite element analysis that our design would comply with that during the testing. We also did fatigue analysis uh, <clears throat> for LRFT 6.6, so all the critical parts that get tension and uh, combined tension and bending, we uh, designed them for infinite fatigue life. Uh, but then the parts that were, let's say, either only compression or only bending, uh, those parts we designed for finite 50-year uh, service life as the project uh, specifications required. So uh, fatigue analysis was also an important part of, of design of these uh, bearings. These are just some pictures. Uh, this is the concave part with the higher grade sliding material. <clears throat> this is the convex part upside down. Um, and here you can see the chroming for the low friction. The central convex part, uh, in this case, you don't see it here, but we had embedded pressure sensors, four of them uh, at four uh, points here under the sliding material. <laughs> Here you see assembly of the uh, sliding part and you see some wires coming out that are that's for the pressure sensors. This is the bottom fixed assembly, the guide and the uplift claw and it's all bolted like I mentioned. This is the full bearing, this is the smaller one, the, uh, uh, the side spine bearing. Uh, like I said, it's upside down because of the space concern, the sliding plate is on bottom. Um, and then you have these uh, bellows, which are like accordion, because a dust skirt really only works on elastomeric bearing or something that's fixed. When something is moving, you cannot use a dust skirt. So you need like this bellow, this black parts uh, bellow style, which is like accordion of a piano. So it has several leaves and then it moves front and back. Uh, and that way you make sure that you don't get any dust and dirt on the stainless uh, sliding surface. And then testing, uh, we had to do quite some testing on these bearings, the standard tests, proof load, compression test, friction test, horizontal force test, that's standard, but then we also had to do some special tests. <laughs> uh, proof load <clears throat> tension test, 250% uh, of the design load. And then more, most important was the cyclic tension compression test to simulate the frequent uh, uplift. We had to do 2000 cycles of tension compression um, and uh, not all labs can do it. Uh, tension test itself is hard and cyclic tension compression test, you know, to so, so much load is, is very difficult. So we had to fly the bearing to Germany to do the test. Uh, HNTB also came there to witness the testing uh, and the passing criteria, like I said, uh, was uh, less than a 16th of an inch of vertical uh, deviation <clears throat> movement during the cycles or at the end of the test. and. All went well, the bearings passed. So we brought the bearings here uh, to the site. Uh, here's uh, pictures I took when I was on the site um, of lifting of the bearing, lowering of the bearing under the deck, uh, and the replacement was done uh, by American Bridge uh, with live load traffic was, uh, so that was also pretty uh, amazing. Uh, and then uh, this is the installation of the bearings. Um, here you can see a close-up picture uh, of the bearing. They have been in service now for two and a half to three years, to, depending on the location. Um, they're working very well. Um, and now when you go on the bridge and you stand on, uh, right on top of the bearing on the finger joint, you can feel no vi vertical vibration at all. The bridge moves very smooth forth and back. Uh, so DRB is, is happy with the bearings uh, and here, uh, incidentally, when I was there, uh, you could, it was raining, so you could see that how the bellows protect the bearings from the rain. And we also provided a crown in the middle and slope, so the water drains and falls through, so it doesn't go on the uh, stainless steel interface. But that was it for this project. Uh, I will move on uh, um, to the second case study. <laughs> so 
it's a suspension bridge from Latin America. This project is still ongoing, so the owner prefers that we keep the project information confidential, um, but it's one of the largest, or once complete, it will be one of the largest suspension bridges in Latin America. And here, um, the owner had the challenge of uh, that they had uh, wind bearings between the deck and the pylon. Um, typically, the bearings are installed like this, but in this case, these are wind bearings, right? So they are installed between the deck and the pylon vertically. Um, so you, you can see the highlighted locations here, the abutments, as well as the north, central, and the south pylons. Now, uh, you can see here the, uh, the sketch of the bearing from the contract drawing. Um, and the spec called out that to avoid imposed forces, uh, the bearing shall be equipped with a mechan mechanism allowing uh, unrestrained girder expansion of 10 millimeters. So in this view, let's say top and bottom uh, and in and out of the plane of the paper, those are the typical movements bearings accommodate. But in this case, we had we have to accommodate plus minus 10 millimeters left and right direction. So that's very non-conventional, right? That, you have to uh, take movements in the along the axis of the bearing. Um, so that was very unconventional. Uh, <clears throat> um, the compression load is quite large, over 6,000 kips, and extremely large movements uh, in and out of plane of the paper in that direction here. Um, so that would be the longitudinal global direction of the bridge, plus 58 minus 31 inches, so very, very, very large. Uh, but our solution, was a spherical bearing and not a typical compression-based bearing. <laughs> the reason being that when the uh, deck pulls away from the bearing, um, you you lose the compression on the sliding material. So uh, the sliding material can get pulled out. Um, so basically, uh, once you load the sliding material, you get this suction, vacuum suction effect. And when you pull out the sliding um, uh, plate, you can pull out the sliding material, and once it's out, how do you put back, put it back in? It's very challenging, and then it will be very expensive to do it on site. So you have to make sure that the sliding material doesn't get pulled out when this deck moves away and towards the bearing. Uh, second is, of course, there'll always be a relative rotation between these two parts, so you can get eccentric loading and eccentric hammering on the sliding material, which is not really, it's forte, it's designed for movements, not impact loads. Um, so, so when we were designing these bearings, we uh, wanted to make sure that there is no uh, the sliding material doesn't get pulled out and there is no separation at this interface. So we came up with a spherical bearing with springs. So as you can see here, you see two springs, and then there are two more in front and back that you don't see because it's a section. Uh, <clears throat> So by using these springs, uh, what we do is we make sure that the gap is created with the movement, not at the sliding interface, but at this interface, the steel and steel interface. So by doing that, whenever the bridge uh, deck pulls away, uh, the spring, uh, the restoring force of the spring makes sure that the sliding material is always under compression. So there's no separation here. There's no risk of it getting pulled out or uh, hammering or impact loading. And then we have these pins to to of course keep the bearing in, in place and not have a, a horizontal dislocation. And then the, of course, the in this case, it, the gap uh, needed to be 10 millimeters as per the bridge engineer. So we used a spring that has the movement capacity of 10 millimeters. You can adjust that. You can use a different spring depending on, on the movement capacity. The bearing, of course, the orientation is installed like this. Um, the springs are exposed, so we use stainless steel springs and uh, we used IBAC springs, which uh, which are fatigue resistant because they are used in motorsports here, <laughs> as you can see. So they are fatigue resistant springs because the deck will move away and towards the bearing several times uh, in a day. So we wanted to make sure that it doesn't lose its you know restoring force and um, and that it works for this um, frequent compression uh, and then no compression application. So so that worked out very well. Um, uh, and we have done this also on Queens Ferry Crossing in Scotland. We have done this for a project uh, uh, for uh, in Spain, uh, I think for the roof of the stadium of the Atletico Madrid uh, soccer team. So we have done, done it there as well. Um, here is the bearings are not fully fabricated yet, but here you see uh, render of the bearing um, on the top here you see the large sliding plate to accommodate the 58 and th plus 58 minus 31 inches of movement uh, 
Uh, and then here you have the spherical bearing, and then we had to fill in a lot of uh, space because they have a big gap and our bearing is not that tall. So we just designed a compression column, a high section, custom high section to just fill up the gap. But the, but the bearing is really only uh, this part. Um, so of course, and we make make sure with the eye bolts on the sides and everything that you can install the bearing from the side because it will be installed vertically. So that's uh, all for this. Uh, I have like five to 10 more minutes uh, before we take questions. So I'll quickly go through this uh, last case study. Um, so like I mentioned before, we on the Delaware Memorial Bridge also, we have a monitoring system. It's all wired, works fine, works perfect, no problems. However, I wanted to mention and provide some information on wireless monitoring system uh, that we have recently developed and have used on a few projects. Uh, so basically it's smart bearings with wireless monitoring. Uh, this particular case study is from the Middle East in Qatar, uh, where we the owner has several kilometers, several miles of highway. And on some of the locations, on some selected bearings, they wanted to have a monitoring system to uh, measure the pressure, temperature, but you can also, uh, like I mentioned, you can also measure um, movements, you can measure rotations, you can measure the condition of the sliding material by measuring its thickness over time, uh, because so that you know when to replace the sliding material. Um, so in this case also we had spherical bearings, um, and then here you can see four pressure sensors in the bearings. Uh, <clears throat> On a span, they selected a couple of locations where they wanted to uh, uh, monitor the bearings. Um, here you can see, this is a picture of actually a, a tilt meter uh, on the bearing, and then uh, this is a picture from the site for calibration of, uh, of the monitoring system uh, to make sure that you know, uh, we are getting the, the uh, data as, actual, as on the actual bridge. Um, but the data is presented on a, a web user interface, which uh, the owner or the engineer can log in with the username and password, and then all the data is shown graphically with charts. Uh, it's a cloud-based system, so it's also accessible uh, via mobile app. Um, and you can create uh, reports, you can create a daily, monthly, or uh, whatever frequency you desire, you can create uh, reports, you can set automated alerts, uh, because the biggest benefit of the monitoring system is that you capture the event, for example, a seismic event. Uh, with physical inspections, you can you never know when the event will happen, so you can go after the event to check check it. But with monitoring, you can capture the event live, so that's that's the biggest uh, benefit, I think. So you can also set up automated alarm uh, notification system by email or SMS, and then you can also download the data for further analysis in Excel and. Uh, you can analyze the data, like movements or loads or whatever data, whatever sensors you have on the bearing. Uh, and the benefit with wireless SHM uh, here is that you have a wireless node on the bearing, uh, and then you have, uh, so this would be like, let's say for uh, each bearing, and then you have a gateway, say for four bearings, one gateway or one pier, or uh, depending on the location and how much distance is there, and then you have one antenna on the project. Uh, which transmits all the data wirelessly uh, to our cloud system, and then you get it on the web user interface. Uh, so the benefit of that is that you don't have to do any wiring on the bridge, uh, which is quite expensive because you have to have an electrician to do all the wiring on the bridge, and uh, during construction, someone may damage the cable, the cable may break or something, or and it's not just wiring, then you have to have conduits to protect it from the weather and elements. Uh, so with the wireless system, it's 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 great that the cost of all these materials and labor is, and of course, future maintenance is also reduced quite a bit. So for example, on two bearings, very roughly speaking, a system like this would cost $3,000 versus $10,000 for a wired solution. And this cost is not the cost of the bearing and the sensors itself, but you know all the extra cost compared uh, for the electrician to do the work and maintenance and all that. Uh, and the system is all, uh, it's long range, uh, so, it can work on several miles uh, uh, of bridges, of the bridge, uh, bridges, and then it's battery operated. You can just go and change every few years the battery. Quite cheap. That's not a problem. And then it's also easy to use it plug and play. If you want to go on a site with laptop or device, you can connect it uh, to access access the data. 
so that's uh, I, I think with advent of new technology like you have cars now with uh, parking sensors in, in that sense uh, as the uh, with the advent of new technology this wireless monitoring system makes sense it gets cheaper and cheaper and provides more and more uh, benefits and peace of mind to owners so we think this is really a uh, value addition to to the bearings uh, especially on you know landmark structures um that's all i think uh from my side uh i went a bit fast uh, because of the time constraint but uh, i'll summarize quickly here uh, the case studies uh, so custom solutions like i showed uh, in the case studies is possible it's we always recommend the owners and engineers to involve the bearing manufacturers from the design phase so we can provide a safe durable and economical solution uh, once the bid documents are out it's very difficult to change anything uh, in situations like uplift we always uh, recommend owners and engineers to not go for the cheapest low cost initial low cost solution because you know also replacement or repair of uplift bearing is very expensive you cannot just jack the bridge because you have uplift so you have to make sure it's tied down so it's it's uh, very difficult so going for a solution that's going to be durable is is very and safe is because also failure of uplift bearing can be catastrophic compared to a simple compression bearing failure so uplift uh, we always suggest to be very careful there especially frequent uplift on vertically installed bearings like we saw on that suspension bridge it's uh, important to avoid uh, pull out of the uh, sliding material and then also to avoid hammering uh, an eccentric loading on the sliding material to ensure its longevity because once it's the sliding bit is pulled out it's very expensive to to replace it uh, and uh, like i mentioned with the advent of uh, wi wireless technology bearings can be now equipped with a wireless health monitoring system where you can monitor the pressure the loads the rotations the movements the condition of the sliding material temperature and so on at a rather low cost, and especially compared to the life cycle cost of the bridge, uh, it provides at a very low cost a huge uh, benefit and peace of mind to the owner. To summarize, in general, uh, elastomeric bearings, they are very good for small load demands, simple applications like highway bridges, they work very well. But when you have uh, more demanding applications, uh, you can use pot bearings or disc bearings, both in our opinion, capabilities wise, very, very similar. It's a matter of market preference. Uh, or when you have special cases like you have very high horizontal loads, we would recommend pot over disc or uh, things like that. Um, spherical bearings, in our opinion, they are state of the art bearings. They are better than compression based bearings, elastomeric pot or disc. Uh, when you have high rotations, when you have tight spaces, you need a compact bearing. Uh, when you have frequent uplift, tension compression, like I showed in the deliver case study. Uh, and when uh, you want to take full benefit of the higher grade sliding materials, uh, you can still use them on pod disc or last mic bearings, but with spherical bearings, you'll get the high, uh, best benefit of, of the higher grade sliding material. Um, and sliding material, PTFE works well for simple applications, but when you have structures that move a lot, when you need bearings that ha must be compact for very high loads, then we recommend higher grade sliding materials like UHMWP, which just ensure longer service life and a compact bearing. And that's all from my side. Uh, again, the time was a bit limited, so I had to go quick, but uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions. So Ryan, do we have any questions? Yes, hi Amit, thanks for the excellent presentation and the information. Uh, we did receive some questions during the presentation and I'll kind of go through them in order. The first question we had is related to uh, pot or disc bearings. Uh, have any, uh, do they have any restraint for, for rotation about the vertical axis or is it limited to whatever friction exists between the elastomeric material and the steel? Right, so for, uh, a rotation about vertical axis is generally not recommended. Uh, for for example, disc bearings, they rely on the high friction between the steel plate and the disc. So if you're trying to, um, uh, so the top and bottom surfaces are held together, and if you now try to create distortion effect, you'll you'll have torsion in in the disc. Uh, for pot bearings, it's a little bit easier because it's all smooth, high, uh, low friction finish. So, but still. It's very low capacity, we would say. We do not recommend uh, using pot bearings as uh, as uh, rotation bearings about 
about the vertical axis. Again, spherical bearings, I didn't mention, but for this case, it's excellent because you can rotate it along any axis. Or if you have to use spot or disc bearings, you can have an ex a sliding element that is recessed in a circular chamber, and then uh, it can slide uh, about, about that uh, uh, sliding material instead of the rotational element. Excellent. Uh, next question is regarding uh, rocker bearings. Uh, what are the parameters, numerical limits, and safety factors to conclude that one rocker bearing has an unacceptable behavior? So I, I think uh, rocker bearings, of course, you have to consider the friction. <clears throat> um and then uh, for a new bridge you can you know you can have higher grade concrete to make sure that the poor load distribution doesn't uh, so you have to make sure that the concrete can take those loads uh uh and then coating wise it's tricky because uh rocker bearings like or let's say roller bearings uh, it's all exposed so if you put a lot of because you have to make sure that circular roller will always remain that circular will maintain that profile you cannot just put a lot of coating because under pressure that coating will kind of uh, compress and gummy up so so corrosion protection your durability and service life of the bridge is a factor uh, friction is a factor um, and then the concrete substructure is a factor and also uh, because of the poor load distribution you can have brittle failure of rocker bearings or roller bearings so that's also a factor but depending on the case uh, when you have to replace a bearing that an existing rocker roller bearing it may make sense to replace with exactly similar ones but it depends uh, on a case-to-case -case basis okay uh, next question I'll jump to is regarding uh, sensors. Uh, how are they typically attached to bearings? Are they embedded? And uh, specifically, uh, did you utilize wireless monitoring for the case study that was in Qatar? Yeah, so de de depends. So pressure sensors, of course, have to be embedded <clears throat> inside. So we put them, let's say, for example, under the sliding material. When the sliding material gets loaded, the pressure sensor gets loaded, and then we have a recess uh, throughout the bearing so that the wire from the pressure sensor comes to the wireless node on the bearing. Uh, but uh, tilt meter or displacement sensor, you can just screw them onto the bearings. Uh, displacement sensors, you can have wire based. So you can have wire, two pieces, the and then one piece moves back and forth, or you can uh, have a sensor, ultrasonic sensor, where you have a laser uh, that, that points to the other end and then there's no wire. So uh, depending on your case, uh, you can choose one, but the, those sensors itself are just screwed onto the bearing. And then they are wired to the wireless node on the bearing and then wireless node, of course, uh, transmit data wirelessly. Okay, perfect. Um, I think there's two excellent questions I'd like to go over as well. Uh, one question is, is there a large cost differential between the PTFE and the UHM WPE? Um, so uh, like I mentioned, the cost difference, let's say uh, the R&D cost and all that, the cost difference of the material itself is 50% more than PTFE, roughly speaking. But, you know, the cost of bearing does not is not equal to the cost of the sliding material. Let's say the sliding material is about 10 or let's say 20% of the cost of the bearing. So 50% times 20%, so it's about 10% overall difference on the cost of the bearing. Uh, so this is very, and then uh, on a pro big project scale, you know, 10% more to pay for the bearing, and then you don't, have, you get double, you get compact bearing, you get double the longevity. So overall, it's just a uh, uh, much better um, uh, case. The UHMWP. Okay. Uh, next question is regarding corrosion protection. Uh, what is the most common corrosion protection system for bearings that we provide, and what type of corrosion protection do you typically recommend? So, um, so uh, depends on the regions and states. Uh, each state has their own requirements. Uh, we can do three coat paint system. We can do metallizing, uh, zinc spray metallizing. We can do metallizing plus paint on top uh, hot dip galvanizing <clears throat> is tricky to do on fixed bearings works but when you have sliding bearings for example you have a, to weld a stainless steel uh, then it becomes tricky to do hot dip galvanizing uh, we have done that on disc bearings uh, but it's more costly so in our our opinion at least in the us metallizing uh, zinc metallizing is the 
uh, best solution. But if you need even, you know, for like like uh, in case of Corpus Christi Harbor, which we are doing zinc metalizing plus two coats of paint on top just to have that extra because there's a longer requirement of service life, very long service life. Okay, perfect. Um, so I think we're running out of time. We have time for maybe one more question. Um, I think it was, re so this question, if I can find it, is regarding uh, pot bearings and disc bearings. And are you seeing in the market uh, a shift from pot bearings to disc bearings, or is it still kind of uh, common outside of the US to be pot bearings uh, only, typically? Outside of the US, it's definitely pot bearings mainly. Like I mentioned, like in Europe, we use pot bearings and never had any fail failures in the US. Of course, disc bearings well, were patented by a supplier, so they had an interest to promote disc bearings. And like I said, the failure is not really, it's misleading when someone claims pot bearing failures. We had never a failure of pot bearings. Uh, uh, it's, it's a matter of market preference. Uh, in the US, of course, it's more disc bearings, but we still also do pot bearings. Uh, but outside US, I would say overwhelmingly pot bearings. We do disc bearings, but in our opinion, both are great bearings and both work, work great. For sure. And I can kind of input as well. I know in Canada, typically, provincially, they request pot bearings on most projects. But I have seen in the last two years recently some consultants looking at disc bearings and their applications. Uh, I think it is, like you said, a market preference, but a lot of those provincial and state regulations that uh, cite specifically pot bearings, they still also have that brass ceiling ring um, incorporated, which is kind of an older technology that's not uh, as common anymore. So uh, anyways, uh, thank you very much everyone for joining today's webinar.